So we've gotten through the hefty calculation parts. Let's get into how exactly these genotypes and allele frequencies and such can change. So first off, um, genotype frequency, uh, non-random mating will change the number of genotypes that are present in a population, but it will not change the allele frequencies, okay? Two kinds, assortive mating, where you have preferences for similar genotypes or phenotypes, or disassortive mating, where you prefer near tra opposites attract and you want something different than you. Okay. So this only affects genotype frequencies. It's not going to mess around with um, alleles. You're just going to see whether if like prefers like, uh, you see that over here, so like likes to prefer like, you get more homozygotes and less heterozygotes. That's the positive assortive mating. Whereas if you have the negative assortive where opposites attract, you can see a lot more homozygotes in the um, population than, than, heter than uh, homozygotes. Okay. But the allele frequencies are remaining the same. I think it's going to pop up right here. Yep. So again, you've got positive and negative sort of mating. And one of the most common um, non-random mating things found is inbreeding. Okay. So inbreeding is mating among relatives where you're increasing the proportion of homozygotes within the population. Uh, lethal recessives get tossed around a lot more. When they come up, they're maintained. And so the higher the genetic variation or gene pool within a breeding population, the less likely it is to suffer from inbreeding depression when you see this like loss of genetic fitness over time because of inbreeding. Okay. So the idea here, if you keep inbreeding within, you know, here's a, you know, uh, two horses mate and have kids and then you breed the kids together, um, it's much more likely that whatever this not great deleterious allele gets actually passed down to offspring here. Whereas if you keep outbreeding and this relatively, it's very rare that you're going to actually find any of the, um, these lethal alleles. If you get out of that particular family line, you're going to get more healthy individuals. So there's kind of various degrees of inbreeding and then the opposite is called outbreeding. Okay, so the, the highest degree is actually if you're a plant and you're like self-fertilizing. Uh, the American chestnut that I work with is notorious for not self-fertilizing. If you have a chestnut all by itself, it's not going to do anything. If you have like a line of clones of all the same genotype, they're not going to do anything. You have to have at least two different varieties in order for it to, um, to uh, fertilize. And then you've got your like brother, sister, or parent offspring is the next, you're like one step away, but still pretty bad. You've got line breeding, cousins, other forms of inbreeding. Uh, you get further out, you get collect within a closed herd, so it's the same all breeding together. And within a breed, it's a little further out. Inbred crosses within species, okay. And then finally, when you start getting to interspecies crosses, now you're getting to what we call outbreeding. So outbreeding depression can actually, you know, too much of a good thing when your progeny resulting from crosses between things that are too genetically distant have lower fitness in the, in the parental environment than either of the parents do. Like the intermediate genotypes just not adapted to either habitat. So this got, was a problem in Iran. They're trying to introduce Ibex back into this area in the mountains. So they brought these Ibex from the Middle East up to breed with them. And then the hybrids had calves in the coldest part of the winter. That's not a great time to have calving season, but these particular hybrids between the two species just um, did not do very well because of the, the something temporally and they were going into heat and mating and then having children in entirely the wrong season. So. Okay, so idea of mutation here, a haplotype where we've got a bunch of different um, things kind of passing along together. Uh, we've got our new mutation arising on a chromosome of one individual. And then if we have some inbreeding, oh man, inbreeding here, and then all oh, these guys run over here. So you can find these uh, homozygote that arises from a parent's common ancestor it can also be homozygous for that founder's haplotype. So you can see this identical by descent thing going on with haplotypes as well as alleles. So not just alleles get passed down, but the haplotypes too. So the more you mate within your, you know, ancestry here, the more you get frequency of homozygotes, uh, the more consanguinous marriage, that's what they call them if you're marrying within the blood, so consanguine there, 
um, you see these homozygotes that are going to be sharing multiple common ancestors, and this is not great for recessive conditions whatsoever. Just look up the Habsburgs. Yeah, that didn't work out well for them. Next, we've got factors that affect allele frequencies. So the non-random mating was just genotypes. Now we're getting into the actual gene pool itself. There's four main factors we're going to cover. Uh, some offspring, some individuals have more offspring than others. Okay. We've got small population sizes uh, result in random change. Okay. We've got migration happening where individuals move into or out of the population, changing the frequency of alleles. And ooh, my guy, there, new alleles arise from mutation. A new allele arising is always going to affect your frequency. You've now got a third option there, and things are going to get different. Okay. So the first one is mutation. Okay. As soon as we get a new allele arising by mutation, uh, there it is. It's now affected the frequency. However, the mutation rate is usually too low to affect population unless something else is at work. Okay. Unless this is incredibly beneficial and it's going to get selected for or you have um, migration and you know, it moves out of the population to a new one, or you've got like genetic drift and now it's like five, you know, 20% of the new population. Uh, differential fertility, if this somehow makes you super fertile, you know, so it's, it's gonna have to affect something else in order for it to really gain traction. When we did the Mendelian genetics lab, like a new mutation tended to just fizzle out most of the time. So something else has to go on. So the next factor that changes allele frequencies is migration, okay? So if you prevent migration between two populations, they'll end up diverging, going their own way. Hey, it's some um, allopatric speciation, yay, okay? But when migration uh, continues, uh, the populations will remain similar, okay? The allele frequencies will balance out there. So the impact of migration really depends on how different are those populations and how many migrants are coming in compared to your population size, whether or not it's going to be a huge effect on your allele frequencies. So the same thing as gene flow. Um, so migration or gene flow, transferring alleles or genes from one population to another, it's going to reduce differences between populations. You can gain or lose traits. Influenced by how mobile things are, like are you a tree and you can send your pollen all over the place, or you know, or is it rocky terrain and it's hard for like a little pika to move around on it? And it also can be blocked by geographic barriers, rivers, mountains, deserts, oceans. Uh, for aquatic species, continents are a problem, and also land. Okay. So um, over time, uh, you can have two populations that are quite different but allowed to remerge. They will continue and start flowing. The genes will flow between them. So things like um, the, the Himalayas, there's a big difference in species north and south of the Himalayas. Okay? Uh, the Panama Isthmus, or whatever you call it, where it's got the um, basically separating the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, you know, before they put a canal through it. And then human-made barriers, so dams, right, massive highways, things that, um, say, like animals have a lot more problems navigating across than, say, tree pollen or flying insects. Insects or animals. I knew that. So, for example, the um, B allele, the on your blood blood type B, the gradient of how prevalent it is really parallels the Mongol migration and how much that um, allele got established with populations that they, you know, conquered or took over, or um, they really more just occupied. So, the next one is genetic drift. Okay, so populations are not infinitely large. Every population is a sample of the previous generation. And allele frequencies drift because of the size population. If you have a very small population and like there's a terrible something that happens, so population one becomes a tiny population for some, some reason, totally random, not selected, not like a disease or anything that you had any chance of doing, but like a you know, a thunder, a giant tsunami, okay, or something just totally random, selected, these are the only population left, okay, which, so a bottleneck in this case, will grow and have a different, so it was, these were the allele frequencies before, this subset had a different um, allele frequencies just randomly, and now the bigger population as it response has different, okay. So the impact of drift really depends on the population size. Was this huge and robust or was this pretty small to start with? Okay. And then exactly how small did it get during that bottleneck? 
So drift can have a huge impact on small populations. Okay, If the allele frequencies are 0.5 and the population is 100, they ran the simulation a bajillion different times under different generations and basically found it was um, pretty, pretty ran, very random as to whether or not alleles got, went extinct or got fixed. Okay. So if we've got 20 individuals and we start out at 0.5, um, and see over time, the number of times we, they ran this, all, things just went wild and wacky. If you up your population by 10 to 200, you never, you know, in this case, nothing ever went extinct. Okay, no, no alleles ever left. And if we up that to 2000, it stays even more stable. The larger your population is, the more protected you are against drift randomly knocking out alleles or messing you up. Okay, so there's kind of two causes or types of genetic drift. The first one being founder, right? You have an initial population, a little chunk of it goes off to found its own spot. Okay, so the gene pool doesn't reflect the larger population that was drawn from. It may have missing alleles, it may have way more of one particular allele. So um, there's populations like the Afrikaner population, Dutch settlers in South Africa, the um, Amish and Mennonites in the U.S. Okay. And so founder, that's when a few individuals colonize isolated. You don't have any gene flow back with the original population. And that explains the relatively high frequency of certain inherited disorders when you have a relatively small human population that um, stay together. Okay. The bottleneck effect is the other kind. That's where you have a drastic reduction in population size. This is where, remember, we're calculating the um, effective population number uh, for fluctuating over time, so 500, 510, 500, like our genetic diversity got nailed during that bottleneck. Okay, So that decreases the overall genetic variability in the population size because you lost something in that, and then you have a loss of individual variation and therefore adaptability. If you don't have a lot of variation for natural selection to work on, you might just out. Okay. So you got your original population there. And then the bottleneck event, you just shake a couple out and everybody else dies. And your surviving population may be very, very different from the original, not through selection, not through any adaptation or usefulness, just random crappy chance, okay? So cheetahs. Cheetahs have gone through at least two of these genetic bottlenecks during the last ice age, they did. And then during the 1800s when they were getting like, you know, hunted to near extinction by farmers. And so there's just a very like there even if we keep breeding them there's just such a low variation in their dna and there's ending up being a lot of inbreeding between existing populations that it's a very um delicate um balance and whether or not there will be enough uh, variation for cheetahs to be able to adapt to new climate and eras and stuff so